you, Dr. Hoffman. Um, thank you all of you for, for coming. I'm really excited and happy to, to see you or your names. Um, and I, I hope we can see each other in person and soon. So uh, I would like to share my thoughts about this topic of how to first uh, use the target trial framework, but also applying it to pregnancy, which is what I do. Um, and I pick uh, one example about COVID, sorry. Um, so we are going to talk about uh, how to emulate a target trial to study the effects of um, COVID-19 vaccine during pregnancy. Yeah, so um, first I'm going to give you a brief introduction about COVID vaccine in pregnancy and a, a, brief, a brief introduction on the target trial. Um, uh, and then we are going to apply it specifically to how can we use it to study effectiveness and safety of the um, COVID-19 vaccine during pregnancy to end with a one slide with the uh, conclusions. So first, um, the uh, COVID-19 vaccine in pregnancy, uh, the, the vaccine has been used in, in pregnant women and is going to be used uh, sometimes because it is recommended by others because women learn that they are pregnant after they receive the vaccine. So by accident, if you wish, they got the vaccine. And because of that, we need to have evidence on the effectiveness and safety of this vaccine in pregnancy. However, pre-marketing uh, trials typically do not include pregnant women and even phase three uh, clinical trials that were conducted to evaluate the COVID-19 vaccine did not include uh, pregnant women. There were some um, that got pregnant even when they were not supposed to, but because the trials were so large, there were a, a handful of, of pregnancies um, that, that were exposed during the trials. And we could have a full talk about whether that's appropriate or not, the inclusion of women in, in pregnant women in, in trials, but um, that's not the topic of the talk today. Um, but as um, a result of the lack of evidence on the safety of this vaccine during pregnancy, there have been inconsistent guidelines um, that went all the way from contraindications of the vaccine in pregnancy to allowing it to recommending it in, in pregnancy. And uh, the lack of this evidence uh, was the main or one of the main reasons for vaccine hesitancy in pregnant women. We did a study in, in collaboration with uh, our expert, Julia Gu um, at the School of Public Health, uh, the Harvard Chan, uh, on the uh, feelings of pregnant women about using the vaccine during pregnancy before uh, they, they were allowed to have one. And one of the uh, main reasons that was associated with an eight and six fall increased risk of uh, uh, acceptance of the vaccine, of, oh, sorry, of uh, acceptance of the vaccine was um, knowing about the effectiveness and knowing about the safety. So not surprisingly, um, because they didn't know whether it was safe, they didn't want to use it uh, during their pregnancy. Um, so when there is no data from randomized trials, that is of course our preferred uh, choice if we can pick one study design, and then we need to use observational data. And we epidemiologists them are up in business. And that's the case um, in particular for populations that tend to be excluded from clinical trials that sometimes the elderly or pediatric populations or uh, pregnant women. So uh, I, I'm representing here kind of the, the pandemic and the vaccine and how things were, things were evolving and there were pregnancies ongoing. And uh, by mid end of 2020, the vaccine trials were going on, but pregnancies were excluded. So we kind of missed that opportunity of obtaining information by the time when the vaccines were offered uh, early 2021 in, in most places. Then the vaccines start to be used and we can collect some observational data. There have been some surveillance studies by the CDC or some registries that uh, started um, uh, enrolling uh, women with the vaccine and trying uh, to see that whether with during pregnancy there were any uh, uh, adverse events. And at the same time, healthcare databases have been accumulating the data. And during 2021, but most likely in the years to come, they will be producing the evidence. Um, and then if there is a signal case control studies might be able to follow up. 
But my point here is that the evidence is going to be available kind of late because we needed to know uh, to inform pregnancies um, uh, about the safety of, of the vaccine uh, in early 2021 and, and not next year. So there was, a, of course, a lot of pressure on obtaining information, but without exposure, we could not have uh, such information. So what is the target trial? Another piece that we need to put together for this um, seminar today. Um, the causal inference from observational data can be conceptualized as an attempt to emulate a hypothetical, uh, pragmatic, randomized trial. And that's what has been called the target trial. And it is just the ideal randomized trial we would love to conduct to answer a very specific causal question if we had no constraints. And the target trial framework makes each aspect of the protocol explicit. And that starts with the causal question of interest, the very specific question, the kind of question that we will put in a, in a, a randomized clinical trial protocol. Then we can design hypothetically the ideal trial that we would like to conduct. And then using our observational data, we mimic and emulate that protocol as closely as possible. Um, and we can be explicit about each of the parts that we would have in a protocol for a randomized clinical trial. And at the end, uh, we apply the appropriate uh, causal inference analytics. So all the advanced methods that um, we have learned in, in biostatistics or from Jamie Robbins, we can also apply, but that's one of the steps. We have to start by having a very clear question about the intervention, the causal question of interest, and designing the correct protocol. So let's apply this framework into um, evaluating the COVID-19 vaccine in, in pregnancy. And for uh, pharmacoepidemiology or in, 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 in drug uh, uh, evaluations, we focus on effectiveness and, or efficacy, and we focus on safety. For effectiveness, when we consider how to evaluate the effectiveness of vaccines that are preventing something, we typically need huge numbers. And we have been, you know, we have seen the trials in the non-pregnant population of like um, many, many, many thousands. So we will require huge numbers for pregnancy. And we needed to evaluate the, the, the information yesterday, like in January. So the first that um, uh, had the information about the safety of vaccines in the observational data uh, were the countries that first uh, vaccinated early and second had the system in place to collect the healthcare data. So Israel um, was one of the countries and you have seen uh, papers on the evaluation of particularly the Pfizer vaccine um, in the general population from, from Israel. So we contacted them um, since they had uh, published in the general population and convinced them to do the same thing um, in pregnancy. And Noah Dagan and Noam Barda uh, conducted all the, the analysis. Um, and this is what, um, and, and we follow the, the, the protocol of uh, um, ideal randomized trial. So this is the general structure that you will have in a, in a randomized trial protocol uh, uh, summary table. You will first have your eligibility criteria, and we typically um, restrict the population to, to individuals that have certain um, inclusion and, and exclusion criteria. Then we define the treatment strategies, um, including when to initiate, if there is a second dose, or if there is a continuation of the medication. Um, as a reminder, this is a pragmatic trial, so um, we we do not try to emulate things with blinding because that doesn't happen in real life. Um, and we cannot do emulations of trials that use the placebo because that doesn't happen in real life. Then in the trial, you will have a section on the randomization and we don't have that in observational data. So we try to get to um, balance of covariates by the adjustment for confounding. Um, so we need to adjust uh, for um, baseline covariates, either through matching, stratification, standardization, your favorite um, method. And if we cannot sufficiently adjust for them is when we say that we have confounding bias and the emulation of the random uh, assignment will 
will fail. Um, in the trial, then we have a section on the start of follow-up and the, the end of follow-up. And uh, typically it starts with at the time of randomization, and then we ended at the outcome of interest or death or loss to follow-up. Um, uh, for example, if, if we are studying the, the, the vaccine, we can end 90 days after the vaccine. If we are studying pregnancy outcomes, maybe at delivery. So whichever occurs earlier would be the end of follow-up. Then in the protocol, we have our outcomes that can be exactly the same as in the hypothetical target trial. Um, and then um, uh, typically in the observational data, we do not have blind outcome adjudication. So we have to think about potential, you know, not perfect classification of our outcomes. Then in the protocol, we have which causal contrast we want to estimate. Um, we have whether we want to do intention to treat or per protocol or both. And the analysis plan will follow those types of, of uh, um, uh, analysis for to get to the causal contrast. So applying this to specifically the emulation of the vaccine effectiveness. In, in this trial from the Israeli data, we included women that were pregnant between uh, the uh, December 20th, 2020 um, and June 3rd, 2021, where we cut the data, that were adults and that had membership in uh, the Klalit Health Services, which is uh, one of the major health organizations in, in Israel, um, had no prior um, positive PCR tests and no prior vaccination um, for, for COVID. Um, and then we had other uh, kind of uh, criteria to make sure we could have uh, appropriate data. Like they were not residing in long-term care facilities. We excluded healthcare workers because they were all vaccinated at the same time. So we would not have um, a non-vaccinated uh, controls for them. Um, and then we define the treatment as uh, receiving the, the Pfizer vaccine uh, immediately at that point, and then the second vaccine as mandated, which was in that case 20 days later. Um, we didn't have randomization, so we use matching uh, of each vaccinated with uh, an unvaccinated control based on demographic characteristics such as age or neighborhood and clinical characteristics. Uh, for pregnancy, we also match on them being in the same trimester of pregnancy um, and if they had any risk factor for um, COVID-19. We follow them up uh, from 14 days of the first dose, just because at the beginning there will not uh, be an effect. And that's a common practice in vaccine effectiveness research. So we try to emulate what a real trial would do. Uh, and then from the second dose, seven days after the second dose, uh, up to 56 days, which is also kind of arbitrary, is where we had more, more data and we were able to produce the information faster versus following up for, for a year. The outcome was the outcome that we will use in, in the clinical trials for vaccine effectiveness. Um, so infection, symptomatic COVID, uh, severe COVID um, as um, uh, uh, expressed by having hospitalization or severe illness and, and death. We use it as a causal contract, um, a contrast the per protocol effect and, and analyze um, the data to get to that effect by using the kaplan mayer estimator to construct the uh, survival curves and um, estimated risk ratios and risk difference during those periods. Um, we also evaluated the vaccine effectiveness, which is defined as one minus the risk ratio because that's the measure that vaccine uh, trials typically do. So um, these are the findings uh, in pregnancy. Um, you can see the in, on the left, the panel with the documented um, uh, SARS infection. And on the right, you see the, the hospitalizations for COVID-19. And in, in red, you have the unvaccinated. In kind of purple, you have the vaccinated. And you can see how after around two weeks, 14 days, uh, after the first dose, um, first dose being time zero here, um, you see how the, the curves start um, separating. And uh, by uh, 59 days after the second dose, uh, day 77, um, the, the curves are um, you know, uh, substantially, meaningfully separated. If we look at the period between 
28 days, which corresponds to one week after the second dose, the, when we are supposed to have full immunity, um, uh, all the way to seven, uh, 77 days. That's the period that we use to estimate the vaccine effectiveness. And uh, we found very similar effectiveness as that uh, estimated for the general population, 97% for symptomatic infections, 89 percent for uh, uh, COVID-19 related hospitalization you know, with some confidence intervals. But um, uh, so those are the results for uh, the effectiveness in, in pregnancy. And with that, we can move to uh, how would we do about safety. And this is going to be um, the largest part of the presentation. So we're not going to be done in five minutes. Do not worry about that. Um, so uh, safety. in uh, Pharmacoepi, we think about safety in kind of two buckets. One is what we do in pharmacovigilance. So you have seen data on the reactions on you know, fever, pain, migraine. And, and then um, there is the safety in pregnancy that refers to pregnancy specific outcomes related to the fact that the mother is going through a very special period of gestation. We can have obstetric neonatal outcomes, effects in the fetus, and so forth. And I'm going to focus on, on that type of safety for pregnancy outcomes specifically. And within that, we can look at pregnancy losses, we can look at malformations, other obstetric outcomes like preeclampsia, neonatal outcomes like uh, being preterm or small for gestational age, or long-term outcomes um, into the childhood. And uh, one challenge, that is different in pregnancy from non-pregnant populations is that we have to consider another time scale other than the time from the vaccine or the calendar time. There is a pregnancy going on and the gestational time uh, has to come um, into our thinking. And that's because the etiologically relevant windows for each outcome might be different. So, for uh, teratogenicity, for malformations, we focus on the period of organogenesis. Um, for neonatal events, you might want or you might need to focus on things that happen right before uh, birth. Um, so we could think of, about uh, trials in, in pregnancy uh, as different, potentially different trials depending on uh, when is the, that etiologically relevant period. And this is arbitrary, but I have divided them into three uh, potential uh, trials or, or phases of, of trials. One is the phase zero when we want to assess um, the, uh, the safety of, for example, the vaccine preconception in things like uh, fertility or potentially even preconception vaccines in future outcomes during pregnancy and childhood. We can focus on what if you are vaccinated early in pregnancy. And we typically think about outcomes such as pregnancy losses or malformations, because you need to focus in early pregnancy, although those early exposures could potentially have effect, effects on, say, plantation and end up in a preterm deliveries later on. And there are many challenges for each of these phases uh, in, in this a phase of early pregnancy, we have competing events um, with pregnancy losses competing with events that happen later. Um, and we have issues um, with a survival cohorts when we look at malformations at birth. So there are some uh, challenges that we um, uh, could also you know, have several seminars about. And finally, we have the late phase if uh, vaccinations in this case happen late in pregnancy. So for um, today, I'm going to focus in particular to this Early, early phase kind of clinical trials for vaccine uh, safety in part because there have been some uh, real clinical trials uh, for uh, uh, pregnancy that were phase three that included a few thousand women at the end of pregnancy. So there is really a, a, a gap of evidence in particular um, in early uh, pregnancy. So um, one of the outcomes of interest has been spontaneous abortions because other vaccines had been associated before with a potential increased risk. And just to be very clear, even when we are going to be talking about uh, evaluating this, the initial reports about this 
um, indicate no reason to worry. So it, this is going to be more of a methodological um, discussion than me thinking that um, there may be something going on. But um, so the, the CDC uh, um, was in charge and did a, a very good job launching very quickly a, a study that is called VSAFE to collect information on vaccinations during pregnancy. And they are, uh, and there are a lot of pressure to produce information soon. So I think they went a little bit you know, too quickly. And the first uh, report that they put as a reprint reported how out of almost 4,000 participants enrolled in this safe pregnancy, 827 had completed pregnancy. So they restricted this analysis to those that had already completed pregnancy. If they were still ongoing and their pregnancy, they excluded them from this presentation. If you can imagine how that is going to select short pregnancies, therefore overrepresent the spontaneous abortions. So you have a bias upwards. And then um, they found their 13.9% of pregnancy losses and 712 uh, uh, live births, mostly among those with vaccination in the third trimester. So they were including vaccinations after 20 weeks where there cannot be abortions. So that would result in an underestimation of spontaneous abortions. And, and, and moreover, they look at any time during the first 20 weeks, um, where when comparing that with the expected prevalence of abortion in the general population, which is what they did, where uh, you will start follow up at last menstrual period, that will also underestimate the abortion. So, there they were some uh, uh, methodological problems with this um, that, to their credit, they fixed before the final publication in the New England Journal and, and, and looked at the specific um, uh, period of interest, six to 19 weeks of gestation. And actually, despite all these biases, they found a similar uh, prevalence of 12.8. So sometimes by doing several things wrong, we can get to their correct. And, and number. Um, so uh, still um, things that um, can be improved, like for example, having a control group, but uh, uh, that's why I wanted to make you know, clear that at uh, this point, there is no uh, reason to be uh, concerned. But some, some like one clinical aspect that you need to know to um, uh, fully understand what I'm going to say, the only thing that you need to remember is that uh, in pregnancy, the, uh, the clinical miscarriage risk in, is um, detectable around week five or six, then goes up around week 10, and then goes down. So that if we were to you know, follow the cumulative risk of miscarriages or spontaneous abortions during the first 20 weeks of pregnancy, you all, always see in, across populations a risk of around 12, 15%. If you were to detect a, a, a pregnancy uh, under research condition, there will be more of a non-clinically detectable uh, abortions early on. So now keep in mind that you know, distribution of when things happen, because we are going to get back to it. The aim of this uh, uh, target trial for safety um, is going to be responding to this specific question. That's uh, coronavirus vaccine, X, your favorite vaccine, early in pregnancy, increase the risk of spontaneous abortions compared to non-vaccination. That's what we would like to know. And we are going to propose a protocol to apply the target trial framework using a large healthcare database. Like one, the, the one I, I use is a market scan, but um, any healthcare database that you might um, want to use. So the first thing in our protocol is to define the eligibility criteria. If we were conducting the target trial, we will enroll, um, say, from January to December of this year when the vaccines have been available, uh, restrict to uh, pregnancies that were ongoing and within the weeks of around five weeks after the last menstrual period to 20 weeks of gestation in uh, uh, women aged over 18 years old that were enrolled in the insurance with prescription benefits um, and uh, were in that healthcare system so that we can capture their information for at least of six, six months before trial initiation. 
And this is uh, sometimes a confusing aspect because uh, why am I uh, talking about healthcare uh, data if I am doing a real clinical trial? Because this is a pragmatic trial. So we will use the information for baseline for identification of the population in the database. Um, we will identify them and randomize them and assign the treatment, but we need them to be in that system. And the observational uh, uh, parallel study will use that same uh, information. Um, so we can require, uh, if you wish, that they do not have active uh, COVID-19 infection at the time of the vaccination, and that they didn't have a vaccination before. In the emulation, we will apply the same criteria, uh, but because we have, say, claims, we need to identify the codes in that baseline of six months before uh, uh, enrollment for this uh, study. Then we have the treatment strategies. In this case, for the vaccine, is relatively easy. We have the first dose immediately upon enrollment in the real clinical trial, and then the second dose we can give as uh, a mandated, say, uh, 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 for 24 or, or four weeks, and uh, 20 days later or 30 days later. And the uh, other arm will be not vaccinated at any time during the first 20 weeks. The emulation will be the same, but we have to ascertain the vaccination from uh, the claims where we can have the brand and the date. Uh, and for that, we require to have the pharmacy dispensation or the procedure where, uh, where the administration of the vaccine is indicated. Then in the randomized trial, we will assign uh, randomly at enrollment to one of these groups um, to have a balanced distribution of important things such as gestational age, for example. In, in the emulation, um, uh, we don't have the randomization, but we'll have to assume that the, um, the, uh, the, the condition on the var variables that we can control for, there is going to be a balance on important covariates such as gestational age at enrollment um, and other like risk factors for uh, abortion risk factors for COVID. Then we will follow up in the uh, target trial, we will start a vaccine assignment. And for abortions, we will uh, follow up until a spontaneous abortion 20 weeks after that menstrual period, because after that, there is no risk of a spontaneous abortion by definition. Or loss of follow up, which in, in when we are using healthcare data, that will include disenrollment from that particular insurance that contributes uh, data. In the emulation, we will start at the dispensation or procedure that indicates the administration of the vaccine. And we will uh, use the same follow-up as in the target trial. The only thing for uh, pregnancies that is very particular for, for this field is that we often identify pregnancies by the events of such as delivery or abortion. So in order to identify pregnancy, we don't have the last menstrual period, we need to restrict our population in the data to those that have this end of pregnancy outcome. Therefore, we have to do a kind of a complete case analysis. We don't have uh, a, a information on end of follow-up um, for those that did not, did not get to having some type of pregnancy outcome. The outcome in this case is spontaneous abortion, same in the emulation as in the trial. Uh, in the uh, emulation, we will need to use, again, codes from claims. The causal contrast of interest in the trials are typically intention to treat, you know, per assignment to the group, and then per protocol based on the uh, treatment they receive. In the emulation, we only have the observational analog of the per protocol effect in this case, because we only have the vaccine that was really uh, administered. The analysis in the target trial could do an intention to treat analysis, to estimate the uh, risk of spontaneous abortions in those randomized to one group or another, and then maybe estimate risk differences and adjust for losses to follow up. Or they can have the per protocol analysis estimating the risk based on the treatment really that received in each group. And if that's different from, uh, different from those um, treatments assigned, they will have to adjust for variables. Um, they could use matching or standardization. So similarly, in the emulation, um, where we only have this kind of per protocol, we also adjust by standardization or matching um, through all uh, potential uh, covariates that might be 
unbalanced, unbalanced to try to avoid compounding. So that's an example of how a protocol will look like. Um, uh, a little hard now is going to be um, more fun, I think. But I wanted to highlight that we um, uh, we focus sometimes in one of the key components of, of that was different in the emulation. That's we talk about lack of randomization, and we put a lot of effort on methods to minimize or adjust for compounding. However, there is another component that is key in all this, and that was the specification of time zero. Um, time zero follow-up must be synchronized with the determination of eligibility and the assignment of treatment strategies. That's what we do in the clinical trials. So let's talk about that in a little bit, because uh, uh, we often forget about that aspect in our um, uh, observational uh, studies and just focus on, on the lack of randomization. Uh, so allow me to get back to the miscarriages and the timing that we were talking about. When we have losses, losses uh, of pregnancy, we have shorter gestations, and that reduces the probability of exposure within fixed periods. So to be vaccinated during pregnancy, um, in order to get to that, to get to the vaccine, you need to survive pregnant without abortion until that vaccination. So that time between the beginning of pregnancy and the vaccination is immortal for abortions. And I learned that from Ali Walker some years ago. Even when I have to say, I thought he was saying immoral for a long time because of his American accent. I'm kidding. Um, so uh, the, if we define exposure as any time in first 20 weeks, that exposure definition is affected by surviving until that time. So fetal losses would be inversely associated with the vaccine, even under the NURF. So if we define a, a vaccine at any time during the first 20 weeks, the uh, risk of abortions that we are going to find uh, is going to be uh, underestimated um, under the NURF. We are going to, to uh, if we compare it with the, the risk starting in, in LMP, we are going to find a lower um, risk of abortions because we didn't start at the beginning. And that's a kind of bias that we can prevent. It's not like compounding. Um, this bias happens because of our, how we define exposure. And um, what we propose is that thinking about the target trial can help us identify and therefore not get into that um, um, a hole that, that, that we kind of created for ourselves by defining the exposures in a certain way. Um, so just to uh, come back for a second to um, how we define time zero, uh, there are three things that we need to, to align for us not to get into mortal time um, uh, type of bias. We need to um, uh, have a person with these three things happening. The eligibility criteria are met, in this case, being pregnant. The treatment uh, is assigned, in this case, vaccination. And the study outcomes begin to be counted, so the beginning of follow-up. And in, in this case, we are going to look for spontaneous abortion. And that is, uh, uh, is true for randomized trials, but the same should apply for observational analysis. So when we have our baseline or time or zero follow-up, in this case, conception, we typically measure baseline covariates before, and then we start the follow-up. And in this case, the problem is that the vaccine happens during follow-up, during, say, the first 20 weeks. And this misalignment of eligibility criteria and the treatment can lead to bias that we call immortal um, time bias. If, if you have seen um, this paper by Miguel Hernan in the Journal of Clinical Epi, what I'm talking about is one, the fourth example that is even in that uh, paper where the exposure starts at one point, sorry, the eligibility criteria starts at, at one point and the treatment assignment, A, A it happens a, a, during a period afterwards. So what can we do about it? Because the, the challenge with this um, emulation of the trial in observational data is that the treatment group, the vaccine, may not be known at conception. 
uh, when we have the data, if we only look at conception, we don't know who is going to get the vaccine in the next 20 days. Um, so there are a few approaches that we can take, and some of them are wrong. For example, um, in, here in the right hand, you have the, the graph that we were using before. We can decide to, in the vaccine, vaccinated group of pregnant uh, women, we start counting uh, when they meet the eligibility criteria and receive the vaccine. That uh, can be here you see in, in red, that can be in the middle of um, the, the first trimester, say, at, or at, at week 10 or 12. That can be the time zero for the vaccinated. You start when you have eligibility criteria and the vaccination. Now, what do we do with the unvaccinated? There's no clear time to start, and we want them to be unvaccinated during the, the 20 weeks of follow-up. So we can decide to assign time zero at the beginning of pregnancy or LMP plus five weeks, because it's when we can start observing abortions. If we do that, if you see here in the graph, we will be following up the vaccinated starting at 10, 20 weeks of pregnancy. They only have a few more weeks remaining to have the abortion. And the unvaccinated reference group will have the full 20 weeks to have an abortion. So there is something wrong with this starting the follow-up um, uh, when there are fewer weeks for abortion in the expo. So we do not like that one. So let's ask them align the two of them. We are going to follow the vaccinated group from LMP plus five, uh, and then we are going to follow the unvaccinated reference also from LMP plus five, so that we align the, the two um, time series. However, what happens now is that the time between LMP and the vaccination, we know there was no abortion because we will have count that person as unvaccinated. So that time is immortal. What are we going to do? We do not like this option either. So with the solution that we can um, uh, propose that um, uh, is to emulate a new target trial each week of follow-up so that the time zero will change with the vaccine and including the emulation of each this sequential trial, all individuals who are eligible, that is, that um, were not previously vaccinated and are still pregnant, and at this corresponding time zero. And then we will repeat these trials and at the end combine them for a more precise estimation. And some of the individuals might uh, contribute to more than one trial, so we can account for that using a robust variance. So just to um, uh, so like represent this idea to you, we will do sequence, sequential emulation of the trial so that if we start at week four or five, when we can start detecting spontaneous, spontaneous abortions, we will identify those that have a vaccine and, and those that do not have a vaccine that week. And they are going to be then follow from, from that point on all the way to 20 weeks. Then among those that didn't have the vaccine in that week, they will be eligible for the next trial one week later. If they receive the vaccine at that time, they will be in the vaccine group. If they do not receive, they will contribute to that uh, follow-up up to 20 weeks. And so on and so forth until we get um, to, to 20 weeks uh, of pregnancy. In that way, um, we avoid uh, uh, starting the follow-up at different times for the exposed and the unexposed, and we avoid, avoid the immortal time bias um, if we were to count person time before vaccination for the exposed. So in conclusion, um, I, I think that designing a target trial for observational studies can help uh, identify and avoid biases, including not only confounding, but immortal person time bias and prevalent user bias and maybe other types of biases that you might have in your own research. And it is not because of any fancy uh, uh, analytic approach, but it's because of thinking of, about um, the, uh, the design of the observational study for causal inference questions. Um, a, as a target trial forces us to be very explicit with the question, with the study population, the eligibility criteria, the strategies that we want to compare, the basic principles as, such as starting follow-up and when do we uh, uh, stop follow-up, um, and the causal contrast and then the analytic approach at the end. So that um, we selected um, uh, 
an easy example that with the vaccine, which is a point exposure, there may be much more complicated uh, uh, treatments that we want to evaluate that require continuation of treatments. And um, there may be other phases in pregnancy that uh, bring you know, um, more complications, like trying to look at preconception or trying to look at neurodevelopmental outcomes later on. Uh, but the concept of thinking and, and imagining a trial can help um, all of the phases. And with that, I want to you know, thank you all for joining us today. And uh, just briefly, I would like to uh, acknowledge my, my colleagues that uh, ha have been thinking about this with me um, in the Costa Lab, Johan, Chiu, and Miguel Hernan, and uh, from the School of Public Health, at the Chan School in general, Jennifer Island, um, uh, that has been thinking about this with me and spent many hours during the pandemic in Zooms with Johan, thinking about these protocols. Um, Julia Wu, who um, was uh, uh, leading the, uh, the survey on hesitancy in pregnancy for the vaccine. My colleagues at Brigham and Women, um, the uh, H4P group, where I do with them all the, the database uh, studies. I've been working with them for a long time. Krista Hewitt and Brian Bateman. The Clalit investigators, particularly Noah Dallan and Noam Barda, did all the work um, for the effectiveness uh, target trial. Um, my colleague, Diego Witniski, uh, with whom I have been doing the, the registries for pregnancy. So uh, thank you very much. I think we have um, some time for uh, questions and answers. If, if you wish.